ready. Yeah. Hey. And we're hey. back. Good evening. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. I'm taking the spring of my neck. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, the music playing, you don't really hear the squeak anyway, so that's good. That's true. Oh, a little oil in there, yeah. yeah. The hole in that bucket, dear Liza. There you go. <laughs> okay, well. <laughs> dear Henry. <laughs> uh, good evening, CDB, Jamie, Harold, and Jay Legier. Everybody from YouTube and everybody oh, from circle things. Facebook. And I'm glad to see you here next week. Yeah, and that's the, you know, I found out that was a tennis racket with no strings after all those years. <laughs> what? Was it really? I don't know, if it's romper room or whatever. But <laughs> I'd hide behind the furniture so she wouldn't see me. <laughs> well, she found me every week. <laughs> I'm blurry. You are blurry. There we go. Hey, there we go. Okay. That's 3D if I cube to get myself back in focus. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Bill says he's got uh, snow in Edmonton. Oh, no. Keep it oh, there. Doo -doo -doo -doo. You just keep it there. <laughs> yeah, That's it. You know yeah, keep it there. The snow does in the winter to us guys. Yeah. It's, it brightens the ground. And it brightens the sky. You're right. Yeah. It's like the artificial light pollution. It is. Only if there's clouds to reflect it. True. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. And we never get them in the winter, so. <coughs> no, Excuse me. No, no. never. Oh, okay. Let's get started. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome back to our Sunday night offering of Astronomy Outreach, the Sunday Night Astronomy Show. Yay! Yay! <laughs> <laughs> I expect more than that, guys. Uh, okay. okay. My name is uh, Chris Kerwin of Astronomy by the Bay. And, and you're not. And you're not. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, I'd like to welcome back our regular co-host, Mr. Paul Owen from the Moonshot Observatory in Hampton, New Brunswick. Good evening, Paul. And Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory here in St. John, both RASC members. Oh. Uh, anyway, okay. Um, first, no, okay. <coughs> All right, let's keep going. Where am I at? Where are you? I'm right here. Okay, yeah. Uh, <laughs> she's choppy, fellas, Bill says. Oh, is it, Bill? Really? What's really? Bill it looks, on? Uh, looks pretty good here. It's, I'm getting a green light from uh, my OBS software. Is Actually, Bill it looked like it was better than Facebook it was last week. Bill on Bill's, on, Bill's on Facebook. Okay. I'm on Facebook. It was running fine here. but Looks okay. Okay. Um, might, be the, might be the snowflakes, Bill. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No. Interfering. Yes. Satellite signal. <clears throat> okay. Anyway, on tonight's episode, uh, the pictures you must take that you never see. Yeah. Yeah. Cool, that left right? them. That left yeah. them. That left them asking the question, didn't it? Um, anyway, for beautiful astro images, there are pictures you must take but never see. What are they? What are they, anyway? Well, Paul's going to give us an in-depth talk on what it all means. Hey, And also tonight, uh, Mike will bring back Binal Bud with another binocular target. This week, it's the Orion S. Interesting. That's a new one, too. A new you one. see it. it. <laughs> <laughs> see yeah. it. See it. <laughs> see it. <laughs> Okay, all good here. Andrea says all good on Facebook. Trudy saying all good on YouTube. We're good to go. Okay. All right. All right. Also, uh, we'll have another uh, look at what's coming up this week in the night sky. In particular, we're going to take a look at the coming lunar eclipse. Yay. That we've already got promised clear skies for. So, hey. That's right. Isn't that Tuesday? Uh, no, Friday. Thursday. Friday. Thursday. Friday. Thursday into Friday. Friday yes. morning. At Friday 2 morning. No, Friday morning, actually, 2 a.m. 2.02 so a.m. Friday into Saturday? No, well, no. Friday into Friday morning. So Friday Thursday into Friday morning. No. Yeah, yeah. No. Go out Thursday night, wait till Friday morning at 2 o'clock and you'll see it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, so Friday it, morning at 6, we'll be in bed sleeping. It begins at 2.02 2, 2, 2 a.m. I'll be heading to work. Friday morning. <laughs> it ends at 7.35 a.m. Friday morning. Well, it's, it's going to set before we see the end of it, isn't it? It is, yeah. 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 Thank you for clarifying that. Look at the best part, yeah. Okay. Liquify. Clear as mud. Let's go back to the show. <laughs> we got a big show here, guys. <laughs> okay, we're also going to have a look at what's coming up this week. Uh, Paul provided another interesting Rosanna's Fun Facts uh, segment this week as well. Uh, and thanks to your participation, we have a large number of your wonderful images to share again this week. And we're going to talk about future sharing of images because we're going to have to 
We're going to have to size it down a little bit because I'm up to 50-some photos this week, and it's just incredible amount of interest in it, but we have to try to squeeze it into our one-hour show, too. So we're going to try to get the best of, of uh, everybody sends in a couple of photos, and that would be great that we can get everybody on for the show. Um, anyway, so uh, sit back, grab your favorite beverage and your snack, and enjoy. And remember, this is a family-friendly live broadcast. There you go. Save favorite beverage for me, too. I'll just Ooh. say that's a it's a cup. I'm not going to say what's in it's it. It's a little one. Yeah. I'm waiting <laughs> yeah. for mine. There. Um, so if you have any questions about the night sky or astronomy equipment, please let us know, and we're happy to try to answer the questions here for you. So let's get started with tonight's program. Brian says lots of interrupting. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, that's us. Oh, we that's, interrupt yeah. each other. Yeah. that's it. That's what's yeah. happened. Oh, he's talking about that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, that does happen a lot. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so in closing tonight, thanks again. Uh, nope. Let's go. Let's go to the next part. We're going to start it with uh, Paul's going to give us a talk first of all. I guess we'll start there. How's that, Paul? Oh, okay. I can do that. Okay, we'll do that first, and then we'll get into uh, our other topics. Give you a chance to get ready for Rosanna after that. So. Yeah. Get some stuff up on the screen <laughs> so you can see what I'm trying to show you. Okay. All right, Next slide. So before, before I get stuff <laughs> up on the screen, we had that kind of funny question. So, in order to take the pictures, to take the one you see behind behind me, um, you got to take a whole bunch of pictures that you'll never see. And uh, for those who are uh, experienced with astrophotography, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. And for those who aren't, welcome to our world, because now you are going to learn what we, uh, what we go through to get what you see behind us. So what I'm talking about, uh, I'm going to share my screen and we'll get right into it. And I'm just going to do it here. I'm not going to try to do a specific. Well, maybe I can. We'll see what happens. Uh, but that's one I want to share. Share it. Okay, let me know if you see it. Yep, it's up yep. there. Okay. So what we're going to talk about are calibration frames. What are they and why do I need them? Well, basically, calibration frames are, um, well, I guess we'll, I'll, I'll just follow the, the script because that's pretty much what's in there, and I'll explain it as we go. So in taking astrophotography um, images, uh, we take the light frames, and the light frames are these, these are the actual images that you're, that you're trying to take pictures of. And the more of these that you take, the resolution your image will have. So this is the reason why we take a whole bunch and stack them together so we can get better what they call signal to noise, which simply means that the more that you take, the higher the signal, the picture that you're looking for, and to the noise, the graininess uh, you will have. So that's extremely important in uh, clear images. We also take dark frames. Now dark frames are taken to remove hot pixels, amp glow, and general sensor noise from your from your camera. And you should take between 20 and 50 dark frames. You can take these when the weather isn't good. So when you have a cloudy night, don't go, oh, it's a cloudy night. Go, yay, you know what? It's a cloudy night. I can get my dark frames done. Because with these, you can actually, you can actually do a library of them. So you only have to do them about once every six months instead of every time that you go out, unless you have a DSLR. And we'll talk about that. Um, so for a DSLR, they should be taken just before or just after your light frames to keep the temperature as close to the light frames as possible, thus creating equal sensor noise between the dark frames and the lights. So that when you actually subtract them, you're subtracting what's on the light frames with the dark frames. Because all that same sensor noise that you see um, that I'm going to show you in a second, that's also in the light frames and that has to come out. Um, so these must be taken with the same length of time, the same temperature, and the same exposure time as the light frames. But you don't need to take as many. So if you're doing like 100 light frames, you know, you can probably get away with 20 dark frames. If you're doing two or three or 400 light frames, then you might want to consider putting about 50 dark frames in there. So you definitely need your dark frames. Now, let me show you what dark frames are. So dark frames are what you're seeing right here. You're seeing these, what appear to be two stars that are off in the distance, when in fact, those are not stars at all. That's what they call amp glow. So some cameras, sensors, um, have um, um, 
uh, circuits that are very, very close to in and around the sensor itself. And so what happens is the heat of those or whatever the case is coming off those sensors can be picked up by the sensor itself and create these, these glows of light. Now, usually if you're doing um, something like this, you have glow on one side. Most people say, I only see glow on one side, but you're seeing it on both sides on, this, on the one that I have. And the reason that I chose this frame was because when you're doing uh, uh, astrophotography for a long time at night, eventually you're gonna cross the meridian. And when you cross the meridian, which is that line that is right down the very center when you're standing outside looking, when you're looking due south or due north, if you could draw a line straight up in the air and then drop it behind you, that's the meridian. That's the point where east sky meets the west sky and that's the crossing point. So what happens at nighttime is your camera and your uh, telescope, you don't want them to hit the legs of your tripod. So at a certain point in time, you have to actually flip those over and put the camera on the west side and, and the weights on the east side. And when you do that, that flips your camera upside down. When that happens, obviously, the amp glow is now on the other side. So you have, that's the reason why sometimes you'll even get two uh, uh, amp glows like I'm showing you here. And uh, so I, I, that's the reason I chose this. I want to point that out. Also, there'd be a ton of hot pixels on this. So like those white little spots and there's black spots or there's hot and cold pixels. All of those things are what ma um, your dark frames are designed to take away from your images. Taking dark frames, quite simple. All you do basically is take your telescope cover and cover your scope back up. You're going to take it in a dark environment, not like what you see here. I just took the picture of the thing in the daytime. You can see that. But you want the environment as dark as possible. And again, it's got to be the same temperature, length, and exposure as whatever the light frames are. Not as many, but all the other things being equal, <clears throat> that's what you have to do. So that's basically dark frames. Next comes the flat frames. So flat frames require you to take care, or flat frames are required, sorry, for you to take care of what they call vignetting, darkening of the corners, uh, dust in your optical terrain, and a few things like that. You should keep, uh, you should be taking, these should be, my first day of my new tongue, these should be taken right after your light frames in order to keep the optical aberrations the same force of attraction. Now, I'll, I'll clarify that. What I mean by taking it right after the light frame is uh, you can do it in the morning, but you have to make sure that uh, you do not turn your camera at all you do not adjust focus at all. And um, uh, what's the other thing? Those two things are probably the most important uh, because what happens is if you do that, then you've actually changed the angle that the dust is in the optical path and everything that you've taken on your light frames is now out of sync with your flat frames. So, uh, so that's why you need to kind of take your flat frames, keeping your telescope in the same orientation in terms of uh, focus and, uh, and camera orientation you don't want to make you don't want to make that change so uh so you can do that after or before but they have to remember that you can't touch the scope so flat frames are taken with evenly distributed light in order to mitigate the dust and vignetting for a more evenly uh illuminated image now the most common method is stretching a white t-shirt over a telescope and most people now use a light panel uh to illuminate the sensor now you can use the sky if you want to and a lot of people have and still do that but the trouble is when you're trying to do that in a in a, a sky that's just getting dark or just getting light is the light changes so much you're going to be changing your exposure on your um uh on your uh, uh, uh frames and it's kind of a pain in the butt to try to keep that going and keep them all the same so if you use a light panel you have exactly the same light source and then whenever your first um uh, images uh, that you take for your flat frame to, to give it the proper exposure, then it'll be the same for each and every one of them. Uh, exposures only take, in most cases, a couple, three seconds. Uh, so it, it doesn't take long to do them anyway. Um, so if you're using a DSLR, um, then the exposure uh, on the histogram should be between one half and two thirds on the, going to the left of your camera when you look at that. And there's there's just there's things that you can get into, which I'm not gonna cover here tonight, but if you do use a DSLR, they're very simple to do, but you just gotta look at your histogram on your camera to make sure you're getting the correct exposure. 
So uh, what is an optical train? Because we always hear, it, well, you know, you got to make sure your optical train is there. So I'm going to demystify what an optical train is. An optical train includes any in all of the surfaces that dust and condensation can collect on. And in this case here, when we look at this image on this side, this is a mono camera with a filter wheel and a reducer. And on this side, this is a one-shot color camera with a filter drawer and a reducer. So, um, so what happens is uh, the dust that we're trying to get rid of can fall either on the reducer, two sides to a reducer, inside and outside. It can fall on the filter that you're using in the filter drawer, two sides to a filter, inside and outside. And it can also fall on the sensor. So there in this particular system are five places that dust and condensation can collect. When you're using a monochromatic camera uh, with a filter wheel, take seven, if you're using seven filters in there, times two, that's 14 surfaces dust can collect on, uh, and the sensor, and two more surfaces for your uh, reducer. So dust never sleeps, from the great Warren Keller who says that. And because dust never sleeps, this is why it's important that we always take our flat frames so that we can get rid of the dust. Secondly, the, the thing we want to get rid of, and I'm going to show you that on the next uh, picture, is the vignetting. So, um, so dust or condensation spots, this is what you'll see when you take flat frames. All these little spots you see, those are dust that has settled or scratches or who knows what kind of aberration is on your optics in that train. Um, and then you have optical vignetting, of course, is when the corners darken. And that can be a number of reasons why they darken. You may have a four-inch telescope stopped down to a two-inch uh, focuser, and that two-inch focuser stopped down to a one-and-a-quarter-inch uh, spot that you're putting your camera in. Well, then you shrunk that four-inch hole, which ignites a very specific size circle, down to a very small one, which could be smaller than what your sensor is, thus darkening the corners. Or when you're using um, uh, a refractor, uh, of course, it's curved glass, so the, glass, so the light in the center always is brighter than what it is on the side. So you're always going to have that fall off. So, um, so these are the things that flat frames take care of. Now, keep in mind, and I, and I must stress, stress this, when you look at dust on your objective lens, that is not the dust that you're going to have to worry about. You, your camera and your eyepiece, if you're observing, see right through it. You won't, you'll never see that dust. It's the dust in the optical train from the focuser back to the camera. That's the area that we're talking about, what flat frames are for. How do you take flat frames? Quite simple. So you take a light panel, like we talked about earlier, like I have one here. It's just one of those sketching light panels. I made a little wooden sheath for it, and I bought one of those television uh, mounting things, and I bolted it to the back of this panel so I can move it in and out of the wall when I need to use it. And, uh, and then I put a, a sheet uh, or a white T-shirt over the front of my telescope. You got to make sure that you pull it nice and tight so that there's no wrinkles in it. Uh, so flat frames are taking with an ideal exposure um, of, uh, uh, to illuminate the optical train intruders to the sensor. So this image illustrates the white t-shirt method. So that's what most people use uh, when, they do, uh, when they do their flat frames. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so now there's flat darks and bias frames. So these are the ones that are sort of gray area for a lot of people because a lot of people have a hard time getting their head around what these are. So first of all, bias frames uh, are taken or flat darks are taken to capture the read noise of your sensor. So every time you take a picture, there's a certain amount of noise that uh, that's just going to be inherent in that system. And so what these um, uh, frames are designed to do is to mitigate that noise. Now these ones, when we do what we call flat darks, these ones are taken to actually do the same thing that dark frames do to your light frames. And that is to create the same sensor noise that your light frame saw. So when you take that flat frame, we just showed you with all the little dust spots on it and all that. Well, if you, if what we do is we actually take and cover that the same way we do a dark. So now it's, there's no light getting into it. And if your flat frame was three seconds, then your butt then your flat dark will be three seconds. So those always kind of uh, have to work the same speed. And that way there, the sensor is reading and giving you the same noise that it would when that flat frame was taken. And those are the reason for, the, for those kind of frames. So these frames are taken with very short exposures, with a scope cover on, and in a dark environment. Flats are taken as flats, except 
with the scope cover on. So the same as darks and lights, which we just um, talked about. And here's kind of, oh, oh sorry, that's not it. My apologies. Uh, taking flats or bias frames, uh, this is basically the same thing. Cover your scope, make sure it's a dark. I didn't finish the writing on this. I'll have to do that. Uh, cover your scope, make sure that, that the room is nice and dark. And again, they're only a matter of if your flat frames are three seconds, these are going to be three seconds. So whatever your flat frames were, the timing and everything is the same except it's dark and there's a cover on your scope. There's one other thing that people do not talk about and in a lot of the talks that I've seen on calibration frames and about reducing and trying to subtract the noise before we get into our uh, processing of the image. And this one is called dithering. And this is uh, a lot of people say dither or die. Now you're seeing what's happening here is a time lapse of uh, an evening of uh, capturing light frames. And each frame that was captured, the telescope moved slightly uh, a couple of pixels one way or another. And after that one, it moved another way one way or another. So after each uh, uh, shot, the, uh, the telescope would randomly move um, the, the, uh, the scope so that you're not taking exactly the same thing. Now, the whole point behind this is when the stars are registered, that's what they mean when they register your, your, your pictures, you're doing a star alignment. When you're aligning them, they become stable and the noise becomes random because right now the stars as far as the sensor is concerned are what's random and the noise is kind of a, the same but if you line up all your pictures then the stars become stable and the noise becomes random and when the noise becomes random then it's then it's uh, it's randomly dis distributed and thus reject it from the stacking process so you will get you'll be very surprised how much noise reduction that you get if you dither and dithering, uh, I cannot say enough about how much difference it makes. Not only that, but if you're ever going to get into what they call drizzling, which is another thing you do with your frames before you uh, before you're done with them and start processing them. And what it does is it regains some of the resolution that you lose, takes little blocky stars and makes them nice and round. If you don't dither first, then you can't go through that process because that's one of the prerequisites is to for, for uh, drizzling is to make sure that you dither so dithering is something that's very simple you don't have to do a thing when you set up your guiding uh software in ph2 phd2 for example there's a thing right in there and you just click open that box and it says do you want to dither yes how often do you want to dither one frame three frames five frames choose whatever you want the, the amount of frames you want to dither and then how much do you want it to move one pixel, two pixel, do you want a small dither, medium dither? And that's pretty much all there is. Once you set that up once, if you're using the same telescope and camera, you won't have to set it up again. And so that's just something that you will do every time. You don't have to even think about it because PHD does that for you as you take your frames. So, uh, so, so dithering is your friend. And as they say, dither or die. So that is that, folks. That's my chat on the pictures that we take that you never see. <laughs> Makes sense, Paul. There. Awesome. Um, not sure. Are, is anybody else out there having some issues with uh, audio? They said they're having. Uh, Nancy was having some trouble with audio and fit, picture freezing up. I'm not, not sure. sure. If, not sure if anybody else is having issues. Not. Just let me know if you are. Um, it looks all good from my end here. What we're broadcasting. It actually is broadcasting better than it was last week uh, from here. But, okay. But great topic, Paul. Yeah. Thanks, sir. Now, I'll just send you some. Uh, so can I just put an, an order in for what I want you to take a picture of and send it on to me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, don't, I don't do pictures, you know. Yeah. Click. <laughs> sure. I do them. You want to put a plug in for your subs and, uh, stars and subs, too? or? Oh. Uh, subs and stars, subs. Sure. I will, because it's this week. It's Tuesday night. Uh, let me just find the dates. I got them written down here somewhere. I'm going to make sure they're the right book. Uh, yeah, I'll never find it. Anyway, uh, this Tuesday night mm -hmm. uh, on uh, YouTube, and it's on the subs and stars. Uh, I've got that somewhere I might be able to share, maybe. We got a link there. Yeah. Yeah. Let me just see here. Subs and stars. I thought I had it here. Maybe I don't anymore. Oh, that's unlike me. It's probably here. I just got so many icons on my... 
sure. on my desktop and I can't find anything anymore. Anyway, so what that is, uh, is on this Tuesday night uh, at uh, 9 o'clock our time, which would be 9 o'clock Atlantic for those who are anywhere else in uh, Canada or down the States, wherever you happen to be. Um, myself, uh, the editor from Sky News Magazine, and this week we also have on Samantha Jewers, I believe her last name is. She's going to talk about GIMP. And uh, I'm going to talk about, uh, I'm going to probably go over this talk here, but I'm also going to cover Pixinsight, uh, the Easy Suite, which is a whole bunch of uh, plugins that are, uh, they call them uh, scripts uh, that they have. And they're designed to basically allow you to pretty much walk through a whole system by the push of a button for each of these commands. And you can almost totally process a picture by pushing these buttons on these things. So I'm gonna cover all that. And then, uh, and then Lendry is gonna talk a little bit about the robotic telescope and uh, the issues that we had during the great fires we had over the summer and some of the data uh, issues that they had because of that. So that is this Tuesday night, nine o'clock on YouTube on subs and stars. Subs and Thank stars. Yep. Okay. That's what they look up as far as when they when they search for something yeah, on YouTube. Subs and stars, stars and they'll come right okay, up. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so I, I am seeing a few people that are saying they're having trouble with connection. Um, I can say right now that I'm broadcasting out with no drop frames, so nothing is it's completely smooth tonight on my end. So mm -hmm. um, it might be your connection on your end, and I know Sunday nights are usually quite busy for internet connections anyway. So if you're sharing, uh, if you're not getting a full fit picture, it might be that uh, what's what's happening. So. Um, anyway, okay, let's carry on. Thank you, Paul, for that. Okay, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, let's, uh, how would we do a vinyl bud next? Mr. Mike. Oh, there's that picture. <laughs> oh, bring it up. Go ahead. Oh, you want to? Okay. Oh, no, sorry, Go. Hold on. Okay. Go ahead. I'll just pull up just so you, because it'll show you what to look for. Right. Um, how do we do it? Uh, let me get back to my large me and entire screen and this is what um this is what you look for right here there you go so subs and stars presented by sky news so if you look up sky news and type in subs and stars on youtube you'll find us okay perfect now i want to go to subway i'm hungry <laughs> <laughs> i i once had a sandwich with um a famous actor that was kind of like subs and stars eh? There you go. Yeah. So the stars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Alrighty. If any of those who are having trouble on Facebook might want to give it a try on YouTube because we are live on YouTube as well. So maybe your YouTube connection would be better. So anyway, let's go back to our our vinyl bud. Alrighty. I'm not gonna target of the week. My vinyl bud this week is <laughs> the Orion <laughs> S. <laughs> 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 yeah, that looks like us. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, well the bobbleheads and we get the S going. I, get, I like it. <laughs> I just couldn't resist that one for some reason. <laughs> you know, they're twisting their body like the shape of an S. Okay. You know, it takes a little interpretation, I guess. So, a bit. <laughs> Orion is a prominent constellation located on the celestial equator and visible throughout the world. Looking into Orion's belt between, here we go, Mintaka and El Nilum, <laughs> you will find 13 to 15 stars between magnitude 5 and 7 that actually form the letter S. How to find it in the sky. Most of us know how to walk out and look and see Orion because it's a, a very recognizable constellation. But if you go out at 9 o'clock tonight and look uh, 105 degrees east northeast when Orion is coming up, over the trees in my area, you will see Orion and you will find Orion's belt, right dead center. Everyone that's into astronomy knows where that is. And what we are looking for starts right here between these two stars. There's a shape of a letter S. Look at this. Oh, oh look, at that. look at that. That's the 13 to 15 stars. Now, I put it on what will you see here because there's the S there. Mm -hmm. A little harder to see in that photograph. There's the horse head, by the way. <laughs> but I sketched this in my fine drawing. I sketched this out with a pencil just so you can see roughly the shape of the letter S. You can make it out when you're looking at it in binoculars. It it's, uh, stands out pretty good to say, wow, there is a letter S out there. Yes, sir. 
And in 10 by 50 binos, this is the size. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a good size to see. You can, you'll see those three stars in a row, and it cuts straight in between, the tree, in, the, in between these two. Mm -hmm. Comparing it to the full moon, well, it's probably two full moons, one over the other, and just follow the S around. So, that belt totally doesn't go with the rest of Orion's outfit. <laughs> 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 and that is our binocular target of the week hey. by Bino Bud. We'll give that one. Yeah. We'll give that one three stars. Give that one three stars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And two flats and one drizzle. Yeah. <laughs> Lisa yeah. says S for Snuffleupagus. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Snuffleupagus. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> so we Orion S. Another good target because Orion's popping up now uh, in our eastern yeah. sky, yeah. nice and early in the evening. So, awesome. Thank you. Okay, uh, maybe I'll go next, and we'll do a what's up this week, and then Paul will get you in for Rosanna's fun fact. Sure. Okay, uh, let's go to my entire screen then here. And we'll see if we can get this up and running. Uh, show from beginning. Hey. Hey. That work? Hey. Something's up with a big rip right down the middle of it. Here we go. <laughs> <laughs> that's what's going to happen to on lunar eclipse. It's going to rip a piece right out of it. There you go. Uh, that's the part that's going to be white, yeah, so we don't want to see that anyway. Anyway, okay, let's take a look at what we got in our week. Uh, what's up in the sky this week? And there's not a whole lot. I couldn't find a whole lot of stuff, but there are a few, of course, interesting ones that, <clears throat> that are going to pop up. So let's take a look. Just a quick few slides here. Uh, first of all, tomorrow... Under your clear sky, somebody will have it, I'm sure. Um, we've got uh, Europa Transit, so the little moon of Europa, which is one of the four Galilean moons that Gal uh, Galileo discovered back in 1610. Uh, it'll be transiting across the face of Jupiter uh, starting at 622 until 912 uh, Atlantic time. So a full three hours, pretty well, to cross the face of Jupiter. And following that is going to be... Uh, uh, Europa's shadow. Uh, it starts at 9.02 and uh, pops out of actually pops out from behind uh, it's what we call an ingress so it'll be behind Jupiter's shadow then you'll start to see it on the on the planet from 9.02 to 11.50 p.m. and but Jupiter sets at 11.25 so we won't get to hold to see the whole thing but uh, so Europa and there's the shadow. So those are really neat. Um, these are a little hard to see with even a telescope especially the little moon but um, through a special camera, you can you can pick it out. And, of course, the shadow will stand out, though, too, if you've got the right size scope. So always interesting to take a look at some of those. Um, let's go to Tuesday now. And here already we're starting to see the rise of the winter constellations coming up. So the constellation of Orion now rises about, above the eastern horizon by 9.15 now in the evening. And you want to check out the color differences between the orange-red Betelgeuse and uh, blue-white Rigel. Down at the bottom right, and check out the Orion Nebula, even with binoculars, right in this area, where his sword is. That's that uh, stellar nursery. And look out for the S. And look out for the S, exactly, right in here. <laughs> so we're already getting into the winter time sky uh, when we see Orion rising. I mean, the evenings uh, haven't been that cold yet. The days have been perfect, really, but uh, we wouldn't think it's November, but that's uh, a reminder for us all right there. Of course, also the... Um, we're starting to see the winter circle that's rising by midnight now as well. So the winter circle is an asterism, like the Big Dipper, or Little Dipper. Those are not constellations. Those are just shapes in the sky that look like something else. Um, but they're really not constellations. So the winter circle, in this case, is what we call an asterism. It's a group of stars signifying a particular shape. In this case, the group of stars are making the winter circle are Capella and Auriga, way up here, uh, Aldebaran and Taurus, which is the eye, the bullseye. Um, Rigel down here in Orion, the, the foot of Orion. Uh, Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, which is in Canis Major. Uh, Procyon, which is in Canis Minor. Uh, cast, some call Castor or Pollux, but I usually say both of them. Castor and Pollux, which are the heads of Gemini, the twins. And then back up to Capella again. 
and the winter circle rises around midnight so it's up you know from midnight right through till morning and this is a huge uh area of the sky so when you're looking up and you're looking at uh, five or six different constellations it does cover a big patch of sky so it's pretty hard to miss but it's also hard to get the whole thing in a shot if you're trying to get a picture of everything but uh, that's another reminder that we are winter is here pretty well uh, Wednesday uh, the Leonid meteor shower peaks now the Leonid meteor shower occurs each year in November and it peaks this year early in the morning of November the 17th which is Wednesday uh, the Leonids are bright meteors can also be very colorful and are considered to be some of the fastest meteors out there according to NASA. Uh, Leonids are also known for their fireballs which are larger explosions of light and color that can persist longer than the average meteor streak as well as earth grazers um, which are meteors that streak uh, close to the horizon and are known for their long and colorful tails. In 2022 we have to deal with a waxing gibbous moon which will make it hard to see the fainter meteors. Now, the best time to look is just before dawn, after the moon has set. So uh, it's not a real good show, but there have been years in the past when there have been a really good show. Now, Leonids are caused by particles that interact with our atmosphere that originate from the comet 55P Temple Tuttle. Now, Leonids are known for meteor storms, actually. The 1833 Leonid meteor storm 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 <laughs> storm <laughs> uh, produced more than 100,000 meteors per hour there's no such storm expected this year unfortunately probably a good thing because we'll have cloudy sky anyway but uh, but it does happen every once in a while imagine 100,000 meteors an hour uh, and sky watchers can expect to see anywhere from 10 to 15 meteors an hour at the peak of the Leonid meteor shower according to earth sky and that is under ideal conditions which includes a rural location and a moon that's absent in the sky Again, moonset is at 5:28, so uh, five o'clock or so. If you're at that time, the moon's not going to really bother you because it's way off in the western part of the sky anyway. So, if you have a clear sky, you want to go out and take a look. On Wednesday, the uh, moon is two degrees from Uranus, and it can be called Uranus or Uranus. I know under, I've, I've uh, actually done some research on that, and they can call it either one. Uranus is actually 17 times farther from the sun than Earth. It's going to be two degrees from the moon. So it's a good time to be able to pick up uh, the planet Uranus because it'll fit in the same field of view of binoculars uh, with the moon. Just, so just look above the moon, about uh, two finger widths above the moon, and you should find Uranus. Uh, if you want to call it Uranus, you can, use, you can enjoy these facts. It's up to you. These are some things I found. Ur Uranus is full of gas. It is mostly composed of ice and rocks or ice and gas, sorry. Uranus smells like farts. <laughs> yeah, somewhere some scientists had to say, okay, we got to make sure it smells like this. So yeah. let's do an experiment. Line up. <laughs> we'll make sure that our instruments pick up that particular smell. <laughs> the scientists, scientists have discovered hydrogen sulfide in its upper atmosphere. <laughs> now, NASA, we go down a black hole. Yeah, we're going down. A, yeah, we are this one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I figured. You know, I might as well go this way. Why not? Because it's always the, it's a joke anyway, right? So, so oh, NASA. Goodness. NASA flew by Uranus and snapped a lot of pics. <laughs> <laughs> there's, only yeah. been, uh, been uh. One, uh, there's only been one flyby past it: the Voyager two approach, <laughs> and January twenty fourth, nineteen eighty six, <laughs> and the next one. Uh, Uranus, Uranus is huge. It's the fourth largest <laughs> object in the solar system. Might as well keep going. <laughs> and finally, uh, the EU. Oops, oop, The EU wants to probe Uranus. <laughs> uh, the European Space Agency has wanted to send a probe to study Uranus. Uh, the plan is to launch it in 2022 or 2025, reaching it in 2037. I could go on all day with these, but I figured that was enough to fill a page up. So, Light that candle. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I get a laugh out of that. Uh, okay. And, uh, of course, Friday, November the 19th, a partial lunar eclipse. And the lunar eclipse occurs when the sun, earth, and moon align so that the moon passes into earth's shadow, the thicker part of our shadow. Uh, in a total lunar eclipse, the entire moon falls within the darkest part of earth's shadow called the umbra. And in this eclipse, up to 99.1% of the moon's disk will actually be within earth's umbra. The best viewing is going to take place uh, around the peak of the eclipse or on 
at 9.03 UTC time, which is 5.03 our time, or 4.03 Eastern time. This part of the eclipse is visible in all of North America, as well as large parts of South America, Polynesia, Eastern Australia, and Northeastern Asia. So this is what we'll get to see. 7 o'clock is when it uh, really begins, the, the uh, deep penumbral. Uh, it'll be halfway into the umbra at 8, 9.03, the greatest eclipse, 10.05, 50 percent and 11.05 so of course take four hours off that now because we step back to Atlantic Standard Time again so so uh, I do expect to be live watching that if the uh, weather cooperates of course and I'll be going live somewhere around 1:30 uh, a.m. Friday morning and we'll run until uh, we can't see it anymore and I hope to have a nice great big thermos full of coffee anyway that's what's <laughs> happening throughout the week with uh, the lead up to friday was is the main event so again i'd like to go back to lisa's look up lisa's uh, look up astronomy and more she's on facebook lisa's on here tonight with us lisa fanning uh you can find her at ruby moonbeams on instagram twitter and facebook and lisa gives us this beautiful little chart that i like to refer to and i've gone through this to take a look at what was coming up this week so here is the date of uh the event here are all the events and the date uh, she has her peak times listed here, and then the seeing tools, so either eyeballs, binoculars, or telescope, and maybe all three. So I encourage you to go follow her page. And uh, this is another one. Uh, you can go to sjastronomy.ca, where we have the, the monthly map up. So this is uh, November to December. Uh, so all of the events that are listed in the, uh, the uh, Observer's Handbook, the RASC Observer's Handbook, are listed here. So... Uh, just pick by the date, and you can see what's happening, uh, particularly on that particular date. So that's something to go do. Just go to sjastronomy.ca, go to the right-hand side. You'll see the calendar there. You can download it as a PDF and print it off and put it on your refrigerator. And it gives you a nice reminder. So that's what's going on this week coming up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yeah, all about Uranus. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> it was going to be talked about anyway. I couldn't say Uranus any longer. It had to be brought up, so why not make it fun? <laughs> well, at least it's it's in the uh, it's in the the archives stating that it can be pronounced both ways. It can. If you're yep. talking scientifically and you want to chuckle, you can use one or the other. That's and that that's what they do. <laughs> <laughs> why they named it that, George? I didn't just call it George by its original name, but I guess that's more Somewhere fun. Somewhere down the road, somebody said they're going to laugh at this one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially when they found out it smelled like farts. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, let's go with uh, Rosanna's fun fact talk next, maybe. All right. And we're going to get the photos after that. I'll try again. All right. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> and, uh, well, actually, uh, maybe I'll get that running here first. Jamie says, I might need the box of coffee from Timmy's. I'm quite agree with you, Jamie. That'll be a long night. Oh. Rosanna's Fun Cats. Hey! Well, welcome back, Rosanna. Good to see you again. And she is, as usual, very timely with her fun fact. And this week's uh, fun fact, uh, keeping in line, with eclipses. So she writes, uh, with the excitement building for Friday, November the 19th, lunar eclipse, and with only 879 minus three, I wrote this on Thursday, uh, days until the next Canadian solar eclipse, I was wondering how these momentous moments were commemorated throughout history. Today we have Facebook to stream your view live, thank you, Chris, and before COVID, people would gather uh, to view the eclipses together. Remember August 20, 2017 at the, the uh, Irving Nature Park? <laughs> Seems like a long time ago, but it was only 1,546 days ago. Wow. <laughs> Is that all? <laughs> <laughs> wow, where does the time go? So in ancient times, people viewed eclipses with great fear and often believed these celestial events were uh, omens or uh, portents of change. The first verif verifiable eclipse observation was made June 15, 763 BCE, before the Common Era, uh, by the Azraeans 
Soon well-documented viewings were recorded by the Chinese and the Greeks. Who skipped the sun god's prayer this morning? Ooh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> but it was the Chaldean astronomers of the Neo-Babylonian Empire who first figured out that the sun-moon eclipse connection, known as the Ceres cycle, uh, this period of 6,585.32 days is the length of time one must wait after one total solar eclipse to see another nearly identical one occur. This ability to understand eclipses and predict when they would happen gave people in the, no, in, in the now a power to wield over the masses. The Romans used eclipses as a propaganda device to promote military campaigns or political agendas. You have to admit, being able to predict such an event would make the soothsayer of those, some, um, of those times seem very powerful. Now, eclipses were events that captured people's attention so much so that when the Greeks invented coinage, ellipse, uh, eclipses were often the artworks featured. Below are a range of coins from the 4th century BCE to 1241 AD. Now, each coin's artwork either commemorates or was inspired by an eclipse. Now, there is an interesting history to each one. So I'll just kind of scan through them. Uh, and I think I'm going the right way. <clears throat> so 4th century, November 11th, 120 BC, January 5th, AD 75, um, AD 126 through 128. And again, you can see all of the um, things that are, are that are represented there. August 14th, AD 212. August 11th, AD 1176. Now, let me just scack down through here. And I think there's one more. Yes, uh, AD 1201 and 1207. And then also October 6th, AD 1241. So by the early 18th century, astronomers' knowledge had progressed to the point that they could accurately pin down the location and duration of the past. It has taken much longer for the general populace to drop, um, drop the superstitions. And even today, not everyone accepts just the science. When I mentioned the upcoming lunar eclipse to a friend at the gym, she said, oh, great, that means financial gain is coming. <laughs> <laughs> I wish it were that. I wish it were uh, uh, so. But the real wealth and and that abounds in us all. We have learned and continue to learn through science. So it would be nice to have Canada's Post to have Canada Post. Sorry, produce a stamp like the USPS did for the August twenty first, twenty seventeen eclipse. A really cool stamp that includes two superimposed images. Now one showing a total solar eclipse and the second showing a full moon that is revealed upon the heat being applied. The stamp comm commemorated the solar eclipse of August 21st, 2017. Now there is even an, an, um, an aluminum medal created by Astronomy Club in Germany marking August 11th, 1999 total solar eclipse and it's rare to find. So perhaps our local RAS chapter uh, could create a medal for the upcoming eclipse in 2024. Now, the flip side could show something of astronomical value. Say, perhaps, three guys who donate their time and knowledge sharing the love of astronomy. <laughs> <laughs> you want these oh, to sell, though. <laughs> and that is this week's... <laughs> <laughs> Yay. Thank you so much, Thanks for That's awesome. You move all. Oh my gosh! And how do I stop sharing? Good guy. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> That'll be about That's as valuable as Bit awesome. Bitcoin was 20 years ago. <laughs> isn't that? Isn't that something? But anyway, the the stuff that she finds, I it just blows me away. Awesome. I'm looking forward to that coin. Yeah, so, me too. Yeah. Well, there's a comment. Three Stooges. <laughs> How did the astronomers, the ancient astronomers, protect their eyes while watching the eclipses? <laughs> yeah. You know, they didn't have solar glasses and stuff like that. Rolling glasses and filters. Okay, okay slave, Who's look at the yet? sun. Who's going blind? 
You. <laughs> yeah, you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell me what's going on. Yeah. yeah, who's the canary in the coal mine? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, Rosanna, thank you so much for that. Yes. That was fantastic. Awesome. Thank awesome. you very much. Okay, uh, let's go again. Let's hope that uh, we get some nice weather on Friday for sure. And yeah. and for the April 8th. That would be uh, amazing. That's going to pass right over to Brunswick. April the 8th, yeah, be good weather. No snow. Shouldn't be. <laughs> Not here. Not here, no. Okay, let's take a look at some photos. we got to get to a pile of photos here. Just give me a second, and I'll get my notes in the right order, I think. Okay, so let's uh, let's get through some photos here quickly. Let me share my screen. And I'll hide that part. And let's make sure we get them coming up. You know, that never happens to me in the gym if somebody talks to me about that stuff. What's that? Maybe I went to the gym. Oh, that might be. <laughs> <laughs> What's a gym? <laughs> <laughs> Who's Jim? Bob's brother. Yeah. <laughs> he lives next to that guy on the stage, Mike and Jack. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we got it's a few Jim. few photos here. Start with from Anne Labouchier. Uh, Anne says, Bonsoir, Chris. Uh, here's my photos of the Lunar X and V from Dieppe, mm -hmm. November the 11th, uh, 745. There we go. Yes, sir. Got them both. Yep. Hi. You do. There they be. There they be. And uh, this is with her Nikon Coolpix P1000 on moon mode. I says, I've always been fascinated with astronomy. Discovering your Facebook page is a blessing. Learned a lot. Uh, thank you for all your efforts and time for sharing uh, your knowledge with us. So here we nice are again. Picture. Nice, huh? Yeah. Here they are there wow. without, uh, without anything on them. And there's the V. Great job. Thanks, Ann. Annie? And uh, we're going to go to Carol Beans next. Carol says, uh, the first quarter moon with some clouds passing in front. Nice I shot. like it. Yeah, like Very that. nice. Yeah. Well done. Thanks, Carol. Uh, Marlene Wells sent this one in, the moon and Venus hanging out on a Sunday night. Wow. November the 7th. That was a pretty shot, yeah. Yeah, I love the sky. Wow. Yeah, mm. yeah. Awesome. Love that uh, little crescent moon. Uh, Fiona Wilson sent this one in. Uh, she's only got the moon pick. Uh, this is on Tuesday, but still a great shot. Nice sliver. Yeah. Oh, no. Beautiful. Um, let's go to Brad. Perry next? No, that's not Brad Perry. Here we go again. Here we go. Hang on. This one is from... No, hang on. That's Marlene. That was Marlene last one. Yeah, here we go again. <laughs> I got a shift tab. That's what you told me to do last time. Didn't work this time. Here it is. Okay. Marlene is this one. That's right. I'm right. Okay. This one is Fiona. Yeah, Fiona. Only got the moon in the pick tonight's a Tuesday, so nice to meet you. Nice shot. Okay. Yep. Next next up is Brad Perry. Brad Perry, right here. Oh, I got the There we go. Shot I grabbed uh, this alignment. Thanks for the reminder, he said. So there's the alignment, yeah. So Venus, Moon, Saturn, and Jupiter. 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 Nicely lined up. Thanks, Brad. Um, oh, back one more. We'll get this one from Rob Thorne, the first quarter moon. Yes, sir. Hey, Rob. Nice. And we're going to move to David Samard next. David got these uh, crescent moon with Earthshine and Jupiter. Love the Earthshine. Mm -hmm. Nice, huh? Nice. Yeah. Nice Earthshine, too. Very nice. Uh, he took these ones here of the moon as well. There we go. To share with us. Right on. Oh, nice. Well done. Uh, even captured the shot of the sun here with some sunspots on it. Excellent. And he sent us in, uh, this one and was Messier, Messier, Messier 2. Oh, M2. Mm. Nice capture. Nice glob. And uh, there's this Jupiter and some of its moons. And the Orion Nebula. Oh, oh yeah. He's been a busy boy this week, Dave. He has. Yeah. Yeah, he's been out. Awesome. We've, we've had a uh, lots of clear sky to, for people to get out and take a look, so that's been great. That's great. <laughs> and he says, "Yeah, I get the, I got the cut." <laughs> you didn't need any. Okay. Uh, from here we got Kathy Adams 
bring us oh, up some photos. Sure. Kathy, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Kathy says, uh, I've been yeah. giving my back a break last week, uh, no lugging my scope, and just had uh, been shooting uh, with my camera and tripod, which has been fun too, she says. It's fun to capture the moods that the moon creates, as well as its details. You know, if we could get people to label their photos like Kathy does, then we wouldn't worry about getting them. Yeah, up. that's true. And I'm going to ask people, <laughs> actually, I was going to ask people when, when we're done here, I was going to mention a couple of things that I, um, that somebody had mentioned to me asking because uh, they're looking for more information. Fair enough. Um, so uh, Kathy uh, as well caught this one for us. Uh, tons of imaging this week, she says. All were done November the 11th. Uh, love seeing the freckles on the sun. I love this act of sun, which we all do for sure. Getting crazy, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And she caught the Lunar Sorry. X and uh, Lunar V, but my timing, I think, was off for the Lunar X. So not quite sure there. You got the V for sure. There it is right there. Yeah. yeah. I think the X is right there, I believe. Or maybe right here. Oh, it's in that area. But... Yeah, it's, it's right in that area. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much... Like she's right, she's just a little late on it. Yeah. Very well. Nice though. picture. Really nice though. And uh, she captured this one. The image of Jupiter is actually a composite of two images. I shot the star field near Jupiter with my camera and I'm Jupiter with my planet camera, camera ZWO224. I then combined the two images. Uh, she said, I enjoy imaging Jupiter and just wanted to try something different. Well done, Kathy. That is so cool to bring the stars out in the background like that. Mm. Well, you know what? It really adds dimension to the photo, doesn't it? It does, yeah. Yes, ever. Yeah. yeah. Well done. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, next up, uh, we've got uh, Stefan Picard. Send us seasons in. Hi, Chris. What a great week it has been, he said, for the night sky. Here are a few more from the past few days, all tagged on the pictures with targeted DSOs. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Got, flame uh, and flame and Horsehead. And, and Ryan, all Ryan. in one shot. Nice. M42 yeah. and Elm Attack. Excellent. Remember the six. Right one. Hmm. I got this one too. Uh, Maybe one and two, yeah. Maybe one and two, yeah. Yep, yeah, two galaxies. Love them. Uh, we're going from that to uh, NGC 253 and NGC 288. Canon TI with a 300mm lens. Wow. Wow. Oh, it's captured for that. Wow. Good stuff. <laughs> there you go. That's what you get by the camera. Uh, from there, Stefan Picard uh, sent in this one, the uh, Pleiades Star Cluster, M45. Never gets old, does it? This is oh. so cool. Yeah. Another, all another shot with a Canon T1i. Wow. Amazing. Yeah. Nice uh, blue reflection nebulae picked up mm. on that. Eh? Yeah. Well done. Anyway. Uh, we're going to move to Lisa and Fanning next. Lisa says, hi, Chris. I know you've been getting tons of photos. If you don't have too many, feel free to admit these. But I wanted to share my moments of joy from this week. Uh, first, Lisa said, I looked forward to my nightly visits with the planets as I track them and their visits with the moon. So there you go. Yes, there she, she tracked the moon uh, with each shot there. Awesome. Wow. Nice. Nice progression. Yeah. The week. You get to see the dance of the planets and the moon, eh, together. Yeah. Celestial mechanics in action. <laughs> awesome. Beautiful. Girl. Nice, nice Lisa. One. And she said, and Rob and I were overjoyed to see the launch of the SpaceX Dragon from our front yard uh, here that in New That is so Jersey. cool. <laughs> wow, nice. Yeah. We that is so cool. She said, we can sometimes see launches from wallops in Virginia, but since Wednesday was ultra clear, we gave it a shot. Uh, Rob watched through binoculars and described an orange light with two plumes coming off of it. We saw it around eight minutes after launch. That's cool, yeah. Yes, yes I, sir. You know, and it flew right up the coast here, right over uh, southern, uh, well, just off the tip of Nova Scotia, so we might have been able to catch it here if I had uh, thought to take a look as well. But Wow. Well done. Yeah. yeah. Nice work. Nice work, Lisa. Uh, Jamie, why not send this one in? Hi, Chris. I took these photos Thursday of the first quarter moon. I got some close-ups of the Lunar X and V, um, as well as the Alpine Valley, which I don't think I've ever noticed before, she said. Let's Excellent. Look. There's the Lunar X and V. Well, yeah. well she's well getting some good clarity in. She is, eh? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Eight-inch dog, too, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well done. And there's uh, there's the Alpine Valley right there. Yes, yeah. sir. Alps, yeah. Um, she says it looks some. It looks like someone just took a knife and sliced up the moon. It does, up the middle, does, yeah. does, does, does for sure. Well done, Jamie. Really awesome. Nice. Thank you for sharing those. And we're going to get to Matthew Dupre oh, now. Wow. Matthew said he took these ones at last night at the moon and Jupiter over the Centennial Bridge in the Miramichi. Also at the same time, Orion was rising. Nice shot. Well done. Look at the colors. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Nice guy. <clears throat> there's a second shot there. Yes, sir. Yeah, there's a Ryan there. Yeah. 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 
Nice and the yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's amazing how much larger it looks on the horizon uh, with that. Was it the Ponzo effect? Yeah. 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 Uh, but when you work, when you first see that coming up, if you you know if you're driving to the east at night, and it looks so huge, and that's just yeah. the hourglass shape. If you factor in the bow or the hunter, yeah. Yeah. Bow, oh my gosh, I think. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I used to think it was just for the moon, but it's it's the sun and uh, constellations. They all do it, right? Yeah. 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 We got this one from Harold. Harold Locke sent this one in. Uh, Harold says, I think I got the X and the V this time. Thanks for yes, building sir. knowledge. You Indeed. did so. There you go. I mean, I got them. Yep. Perfect. Good, good job, Harold. Awesome. Uh, Carrie Ann Moraes sent this one. She said, uh, hi, this is a very crappy picture, but could you tell me what I'm seeing here? This was through uh, in, an inbox uh, as she sent me. It said, it looks like a star on the right side uh, of the moon, but it was moving. And I said, uh, yes, it was Jupiter next to the moon. Yeah. Um, her response was, what? <laughs> that's, <laughs> that, that's amazing. Thank you, she said. Then she replied, uh, going to run out and with my DSLR to get a better picture. And she captured this one. There uh, it is, yeah. There. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's there. So nice it's, capture. Even if it's yeah, freezing yeah. out, she says. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing when you uh, don't overexpose, or if you expose the moon for, so you can see the detail. Yeah. It, it really shows you how uh, physically small Jupiter is right compared to the moon from our perspective. Yeah, I so much wanted to rotate my camera and see if I could get the two of them in my shot the other night, but not a chance. <laughs> uh, uh, she said, uh, very I, nice. don't, I don't have a very new DSLR, but this makes me very happy. It makes us happy. Oh, yeah. Fantastic capture. Nice Thanks. capture. Thanks, Carrie Ann. Uh, we're going to move from there to Glenn Ketchum. Yeah, that was a cool yeah. shot. At the window. Yeah, so says, uh, yeah. he says, uh, this the evening... It's at... observatory window. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a telescope sitting down here in the corner, yeah. So uh, he says, uh, this evening at 540, was cleaning up after supper and glanced up and saw this. Just taken with my Galaxy S7 Edge. Uh, no special equipment. The moon and Jupiter. That's awesome. Nice that's, job. That's, that's amazing. That's a really good job. Good job, Glenn. Thanks. Uh, from Glenn, we're going to go to Angela Michaud. Angela sent these ones in. Capture the moon sitting there. Yep, there it is. Very nice. Beautiful spot. Angela, uh, Angela and I talk quite a bit because she's uh, she's very interested in seeing the aurora. And I keep trying to get them arranged for her. <laughs> 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 but no luck so far, but we keep, we keep trying, so we won't give you, up you on you, Angela. Talk to other people. I'll get my people that, talk that's to That's it, yeah. I haven't talked to the right people yet. <laughs> she sent this one out of the moon as well, moon and Jupiter. So. Excellent. Nice. Very nice. Yep. Thanks, Angela. I'm going to move to Paul Parker right now. There's Paul Paul Parker's uh, shot from West Quaco West Quaco uh, West Quaco Head Lighthouse. There we go. So from the lighthouse. I love the down. color of the sky. Isn't that that's great? great? That's a that's a great spot. That lighthouse. Yeah. Nothing like living on the Bay of Fundy, eh? What a sunset. Yep. Nice shot. Uh, we got this one from Eunice uh, McLeod. The Crescent Moon. Nice. Yes, sir. That must be Jupiter. Jupiter, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, where are we at now? Just give me a second. I'm just going to keep going. We're almost to the end of them here. Um, next page of notes right here. Alan Azier sent these ones in, the Lunar X and the V. Oh, nice. Got them. There's the V. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. A, lot yeah, of people really. getting, a lot of people getting out to get that. That's great. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there it is again. Oh, it's yeah. Prominent, yeah. Like a double V. Looks like a double V, yeah. yeah a like double V. Yeah. Double V. <laughs> A big W. And do you see the backwards C? Backwards C. Show me where. No, no, before the big crater on the left. Big crater on the left. Yeah, uh, it's right, a dark C. Oh, right there, right there. Backwards yeah. C. Look at that. It almost have an alphabet right there. Almost. It's kind of like a nose ring. Alphabet soup. <laughs> <laughs> a nose ring, yeah. Al alphabet soup on the moon. There you go. Thanks, Alan. And this one here you got Thanks. from uh, Jupiter and its moons. Yes, sir. Oh, nice. Awesome. Very well done. That never gets old to look at, eh? Not at all. No. You see that through a telescope? Man, that is just... Yeah. It's just amazing yeah. to think what you're looking at there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, got these ones from Jane Love. Jane says, I have been enjoying the early evening sky the last couple of evenings. I'm not a great photographer, but this is what I've seen. Am I doing okay? You're doing well, fine. You're doing good. <laughs> you're doing fine, Jane. Nice detail. Yeah. You're doing well. There's another one. Oh, yeah. I love her shine. Yeah. That's awesome. Earth shines today, yeah. Beautiful and, shot. Uh, we've got another one here. 
Yes, sir. Moon and Venus. Well done. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice chain. Awesome. Okay, and we got just a couple more. Oh, this one as well, because she ca captured Venus. She was really happy about that. Awesome. <laughs> there. Right on. And this guy. Oh, wow. Hey, Mr. Powell. You know, Mr. Wow. Powell, and I saw earlier, that is, that's unbelievable what you're doing with the moon now. Fantastic shot, Mike. I, I just don't it. like what Facebook does to it. <laughs> yeah, but you yeah. know what? The clarity, even on Facebook, even with that algorithm that they use, it's still clean. <laughs> yeah. This, this looks really good. Yeah. And that's yeah. I really like that Apennine mountain range. It's uh, Oh, it's fantastic, yeah. I wanted I wanted to try to get the detail on that and it come out nice. Well, you know what I like about this image is if you look around Mark Carisma, Carisma, Carisma yeah. um, you can actually see detail in and around that Maria. Where you normally can't. So I mean, you really did a nice job. Yeah, on that. yeah. Yeah, there's some ejector that shoots across there. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You can see all that as well. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, not... even the, the craters that that surround uh, or that uh, border uh, Mar Charisma. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, that's that's a fantastic shot. Uh, Thank you. The Apennine Mountains there, and there's Tostanes and. Uh, Copernicus yeah. sitting right there at the edge. I love the way that right on that phase of the moon, it just gives that nice big shadow. The whole wall. Of Copernicus. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Looks like the push button for the moon. It does. <laughs> 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 and we get this one. Hey, yes. yeah. we're Mr. talking Paul. about detail. <laughs> <laughs> Lot fifteen. That's from Mr. Paul. Wow. So, yeah. Yeah, that turned out pretty good. Actually, I have a better one than that, but um, that's crazy, Paul. That's awesome. Yeah, that, uh, that's with the new camera, and that's what mono camera, well, yeah, you, you can kind of just jump right in there. Yeah. That's, um, that's, the, that's the beauty of a mono camera with uh, uh, really nice filters. Yeah. You can really, really capture some great detail, um, and that's probably one of my favorite uh, objects in space to look at. Is oh, yeah. Colors in there. Just... This is that spot right there, because that's where the cluster, star cluster yeah. is. It's crazy. And, uh, yeah, and if you go behind it a little bit to the left, or it might be to your right to the left, I guess, then you can see all that nice dark uh, nebula. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, this up here, yeah. Gorgeous, gorgeous. Uh, oh, and that's right in the Heart Nebula, and if you don't know where that is, that's in uh, Cassiopeia, and it's right next to the Sol Nebula. So these are, are really good targets for uh, people to shoot because they're actually quite bright. Uh, mm -hmm. But if you have something in a hydrogen alpha filter, you will pick up easily pick up this detail so. that's crazy well paul you're, you're you're changing from colors now to to what emissions are being given off right that's just changing the whole the whole game yeah like it's this is yeah. more this is more hubble style stuff but the detail yeah. in there is just crazy yeah yeah and you can actually see the depth from the clouds i didn't realize that uh this particular uh thing you can see right through it you can see right this through space behind it. Yeah. And yeah. I didn't realize that before um, until I started looking close at this image. And I thought, did I do something wrong? But I looked at it. crazy? Like, oh, we're seeing right through it. You're looking through it. Yeah. Isn't yeah. that something? Yeah. So by, by using this narrow band instead of the RGB, you can really separate things. And yeah, uh, yeah it's just thrilling to, uh, to, to work with it. And that's crazy results you're getting. Amazing yeah. stuff there. Yeah. Um, Heidi mentioned. Uh, Wondering about the picture of the Pleiades tonight. Uh, there was a picture in there earlier. Uh, it was done by uh, Stefan Picard. Oh, um, Stefan did one. Yeah, yeah. right. If Not she sure. wants to go online and look up um, uh, Jason Dane, he's Jason just Dane. put one on his and okay. he's using the same camera setup that I have. Mm -hmm. And he shot it in RGB and, uh, and he did a luminance. It's probably the best Pleiades I've ever seen. Right on. And, yeah. Uh, so uh, look him up, Jason Dane. Jason D -A -I -N. Dane. Yeah. He's from Nova Scotia. Uh, just look him up on Facebook, and you'll find that photograph. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. If you want to look at the police. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Uh, and okay, so if you'd like to send in your photos, please send them to Sunday Night Astronomy Show uh, at gmail.com, or you can send them to SNAS, S N A S at astronomybythebay.ca. Both addresses are working now. Now, um, I did want to mention about photos. I can stop presenting here. So you can see there we had 52 photos to share tonight. And uh, what I'm trying to do is get, uh, because we're looking at adding extra segments to the show now, Paul would like to do an astrophotography tip of the week segment we had talked about. 
Um, I'd like to do a, a astronomy glossary uh, type of thing. So what is an opposition? What do we mean by an eclipse? That type of thing. So like a five minute talk on that, Paul's five minute talk or so on astrophotography. That brings us into, um, we're into over an hour now. Here we are at 910, right? So, um, but if we can, if we can uh, take photos that you are sending, we love every photo, but we we'll want to try to get maybe two or three of each person on so we can squeeze everybody in. There was a few that I couldn't get on this week because of, of the quantity of them this week. So I, well, we love that section and I like, I love to show that section because I love to see how people are progressing through, you know, what they're capturing and what they're, what they're getting later on as they move through the, the hobby, right? So, but we want to be able to capture as many of those as we can and as many different people as we can throughout the, the program. So we're going to try to keep that at the end of the show, which is where we like to have that segment. But we do want to try to add a couple of new segments. And we we haven't gotten to a gearbox. It was another one that we had started and we kind of got away from as well. So that'll be uh, talking about, you know, a particular telescope or a piece of gear, maybe a focuser, a tail rat or something like that. Just our thoughts on it, what we think are our best, you know best ones to look at to buy that kind of thing so the gearbox talk will be added to the show paul's astrophotography tip of the week is going to be added we got rosanna's fun facts we got final bud what's up in space or what's you know what's up in space this week kind of thing we even dropped the what's up in space one so we're looking at between the 60 and 90 minute program and we are looking for your input as well but we don't want to get the show too long that people are just going to say well it's 90 minutes i can't afford that much time right so we want to get the best of the best in there, and maybe we end up taking some segments and offering them every two weeks instead of every week. Well, that might be something we're looking at. So let us know your thoughts on that. Uh, give us some comments on it. Put them up on my page, please. I did have a post up there asking for, for feedback. And between the three of us here, we're going to decide over the next couple of weeks which kind of a format we're going to head towards in the next in the next little while. We also got to look at the fact that it's getting darker earlier now. Uh, we have the ability to now be able to offer night sky views when we get a clear night. Sunday night. If that if that ever happens in the next ten years, <laughs> <laughs> that's what we started it for originally. That's what we started that's for the originally, yeah. And we, you know, we're we're still looking at uh, bringing on uh, guest speakers as well to, uh, from from some other locations. I won't mention too many at the moment, but we have got a few couple there that we're, we're talking to right now. So um, that'll be another segment of the show. So it could be 60, 90 minutes, but. We like to keep the 60 if we can, and maybe expand a little bit into the 10 or 15 if we have to go over. Uh, maybe that's the, that's where we're going to be. But let us know your thoughts anyway on it. If you're tuning in and you're staying on the show, maybe you can't stay the whole show. That's you know we understand that too. But if you find that 90 minutes is too long and 60 is better, then we'll keep it at that. But we got to allow for a lot of stuff. We get so much we're trying to cram into this one hour, and we just can't seem to get through it all. And here I still have to do the closing. But keep in mind too that the, that the, the these are uh, up on YouTube. So right. um, if there's, you know, if you have to go early, you can always catch up on YouTube. Right. Yeah. YouTube and Facebook. They're on Facebook as yeah. well. So, well. Yeah. And the other thing, I, uh, just quickly, I wanted to bring up the fact that, you know, I, I've been posting on Facebook um, my issues I've been having with uh, with some uh, other pages that are giving me some trouble. So uh, I'm going to continue to go. We're going to continue to broadcast on both channels for now until if there's an issue with Facebook, we'll have to look at that down the road. My live feeds on Facebook may be a little bit less, but I'll be offering more of them on YouTube, hopefully. So drop over to YouTube and try to follow me over there if you if you want to keep up on things. Now, as far as the Lunar Eclipse goes next Friday, I'm going to try to broadcast on both channels. Uh, so just keep an eye out for a post later this week and watch the weather and see what that does. But uh, anything larger like that, I'm going to try to get to both channels. So anyway, okay, so let's go to our closing then, I guess, guys. So I guess uh, in closing then tonight... Um, Thanks again, everybody, for your continued support out there. Uh, heard all this before. Our special thanks again, of course, to Rosanna for her uh, continued contributions to the show. Thank you, Rosanna. Another timely topic this week. We're not sure about the coin yet. We might have to take a, a pause on that, but we'll see. <laughs> uh, we really do appreciate all your efforts and in helping us putting on the show. We also would like to thank all of those out there who share our program. Uh, of course, our most faithful follower, Trudy, out there. Thank you, Trudy. Uh, New Brunswick Storm and Weather Center, Lisa's Look Up, and a lot of other people. Brad, has, uh, they, they're sharing our show, so we really appreciate that as well. Uh, remember, too, we do love getting your photos, so send them in to Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com or snaz at astronomybythebay.ca, and we'll, uh, we'll just put them on the Facebook page, and we'll try to get them on our next broadcast. Also looking for, for suggestions for, for topics for future shows, so let us know. Uh, if you see anything that you'd like us to discuss in a future episode, please let, send it in to the same address. Please let us, uh, your family and friends know as well that we are here every Sunday night to uh, help uh, educate and entertain 
edutain, I guess it's called edutain. 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 Yeah, I heard that. Oh, I like that. Uh, on the night sky. So for now, then, from Mike and Paul and I, uh, stay safe, everybody out there, please. Uh, we wish you all clear skies, and we hope to see you back here again next week. And as we like to say, guys, keep your scopes. Point it up. Point it up. Have a good week, everybody.